I'm going to turn the recording on. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, this is a special community meeting uh, joint between the with the uh, Transmark Foundation and the I2B2 Foundation communities, uh, all invited. Um, we will be recording this uh, the session, and um, it will be available uh, later today on the Transmark site, and I believe the I2B2 site, and also on the Google channel, a uh, Transmark channel. Today, we have together, um, we'll be talking about uh, I2B2 and Transmart platforms uh, and work that we've been doing for the last uh, several months uh, on uh, improving and uh, enhancing the uh, interaction and integration between the two platforms. Uh, I'm here with uh, Diane Keo, who's the um, director of the, trans of the I2B2 platform, uh, and we will have talks with uh, Paul Aviak and E.K. Gao, as well as um, conclusion with Keith Elliston. Um, we've been working for uh, a bit, some time now to look at different uh, synergies between the two platforms uh, as we work uh, more closely to develop our precision medicine platform. Uh, some of you may know that we held, uh, we participated in the uh, Harvard Medical School uh, Precision Medicine Conference and Shrine meeting uh, in June uh, last year uh, when we got a lot of interesting uh, uh, encouragement and, and endorsement uh, as we've learned more and more about the number of organizations who are using both platforms uh, and well, we've been working to see how we can make the platforms work more seamlessly together. Um, and I'd, like to, I'd like to take this time to try to familiarize the different communities and um, with the different platforms and some of the history of how we've got here uh, and then start to look at how an integrated version of the platform could be used more effectively uh, to uh, advance precision medicine and uh, translational research. Uh, and we will have some time for questions at the end of this presentation. So um, let me turn it over to Diane, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about I2B2. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for uh, joining us. I um, am just going to spend a couple of minutes um, talking about uh, some of the background of I2B2 um, because we want to spend the, the majority of the time um, talking about the, the use cases and, and features between the two platforms. So, um, so academic medical centers had a lot of challenges using the vast clinical data that was collected as a byproduct of uh, clinical care to support clinical research. Um, and so in, in 2004, Harvard um, was awarded one of the National Center for Biomedical Computing Grants to develop an open source platform to leverage that data that's stored in the electronic health record to support clinical research. And um, if, you've, if you've ever wondered what I2B2 stood for, um, the grant was called Integrating Informatics and Biology at the Bedside. Um, I believe Zach Ohani was the... the the founder of that name. Um, so the sort of vision of this grant was to turn hospital data systems into living laboratories to study the genetic basis of disease. So um, fast forward 13 years. Um, I, I can't believe 13 years has passed um, since that grant was um, initiated. But 13 years later, I2B2 is used um, across hundreds of organizations um, across the United States and Europe. And on, on the slide, you'll see um, some of it. And again, this isn't 100%, but you'll see that there is, um, there is uh, use across um, the US and Europe. And it's used by CTSAs, academic medical centers, um, some HMOs, and, and industry as an underlying technology. So it's, it's well adopted and it's well used. Um, I2B2 is now uh, supported by a nonprofit foundation um, that was established uh, about a year ago. Rudy, next slide. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm going to give a, a quick background similarly on Transmart. Um, in 2008, a few years after the first I2B2 uh, work was started, uh, Johnson & Johnson saw a challenge uh, in uh, the, the systems that they were using 
for building uh, preclinical models uh, and looking for biological knowledge. And so they created uh, sort of a companion system called Transmart, uh, which they called a knowledge management platform to provide access to all R&D data, as well as advanced analytics. And Transmart was born, uh, they developed it for a couple of years uh, inside of Johnson & Johnson um, and uh, it used some of the components of I2B2 and uh, they were, you know, able to be used uh, sort of in, a, in the same environment, although separate systems. Uh, and um, the scientists used it there for a bit, but it was decided that they, they really wanted to release the software as an open source uh, tool. And so in 2012, they made that decision to push it out into the open source community. Um, when that happened, um, it was, uh, you know, it, it sat there for a year uh, and, and there was a, a sense that it needed a little bit more uh, to be developed. And so a year later in 2013, the Transmark Foundation uh, was established. And uh, at that time, uh, a couple of, of meetings were held, um, one in Ann Arbor and Paris. And then each year since then, uh, we've been holding a, a Transmark Foundation meeting where the discussions around you know uses of the system as well as how to evolve it and the community stepped up and uh, in uh, in a number of, uh, of pretty uh, very interesting releases um, the platform has been developing uh, on its own path uh, although unfortunately there was some divergence uh, from i2b2 and so the ability to have uh, a well tightly integrated system became much more challenging as we move forward so you know, as we, we sit today, uh, we're looking at, you know, how, in fact, uh, do we want to, you know, try to, to bring these systems more closely together? Uh, Paul will show us in a few minutes the work that he's done that demonstrates um, the, the utility of having the systems uh, much more closely aligned. Uh, we've also seen a number of other organizations who've similarly gone through a lot of effort to try to keep uh, the, the integration and, and the ability to, to keep, use the data from both systems and the capabilities. Uh, and so we have been trying uh, in the last few months to look at, you know, how can we uh, bring the systems more closely together, uh, both with our development efforts and, you know, cooperation between the two foundations. Ultimately, you know, what we're looking for is, uh, you know, improving outcomes uh, and, uh, you know, considering the precision medicine initiatives, um, you know, that have come forward, you know, how in fact might we, you know, uh, foster the, the development of precision medicine um, by you know, allowing these two systems to work more closely together. Uh, and so, you know, within this, this uh, concept on the translational research side, uh, we looked at, you know, how, where does, you know, how does Transmark fit in uh, and, and provide, you know, the, uh, the capabilities there. And what we're really ultimately trying to do is bridge together the, the health healthcare domain with the translational research domain. So Transmart brings to the translational research side of this equation, the Transmart platform and all the, the various data sets that we've been able to curate and make available through open data sources uh, and also providing uh, curation tools to bring data into the Transmart community. Um, Diane? And I2B2 is really leveraging the healthcare domain, as I said before, you know, using the data collected during um, a patient's uh, hospital or physician office stay for clinical research. Um, again, that's, that's patient uh, data. It's also um, patient consented genetic data obtained from biological samples is also part of that mix. Um, so data is extracted from the EHR and transformed, and that's really a lot of the secret sauce. It's transformed to support um, discovery research. So an example of this would be um, allowing a, a PI to query the data uh, for cohorts of patients that would call, qualify for a clinical trial. I think next slide, and I think um, what, I, what we'd like to do is, uh, is now uh, turn this over to Dr. Aviak, who will um, uh, dive in, uh, show us some use cases and features, um, uh, pulling the two, um, the two together. Okay, so now we're going to change, I'm going to change presenter to Paul. Just give me a second here.
Okay, Paul, you should be able to take it away now. Yep. And can you see my screen? Yes. Great. So thank you very much, Diane and Rudy, for organizing this joint meeting where it's an extremely exciting time of having both community from the I2B2 Foundation and the Transmart Foundation. And uh, where, uh, what I'll be showing or presenting right now is examples of how those two um, software can work together, showing you live projects which are today in production and available from the uh, internet. And not just behind the firewall, so the whole idea is that you'll have a, a access to the site with all the links. You can test and play with all the different infrastructure that I'll be uh, showing you right now. The overall goal of what I think what we, you are trying to do is to be able to help to make new discoveries by doing a thoughtful uh, integration of genotypes with phenotype, coming from the different biosamples where we have this baseline genotype and then where we create all the derived genotype that we want to be able to link to the complexity of the phenotype data that is available and to have something much more in detail than just having cases versus control. And we can do this by integrating many kinds of registries and longitudinal complex data from the EHR, creating the baseline phenotypes and creating the derived genotype phenotypes that we'll be integrating and that's where there's an incredible opportunity of doing this using I2B2 Transmart platform to create those new insights and discoveries. So the, in this I2B2 Transmart world, the way where we've been doing this integration is to use I2B2 to store all the data, to enable to do advanced score selection, and to use Transmart as an advanced statistical tool by Bank Explorer, Variant Explorer, accessing this data. And then once you're part of this ecosystem, you can easily have access to other tools which are already 100% compatible with I2B2, like Shrine, in order to do federated advanced core selection between multiple I2B2 installation that can be across all the different uh, institutions across the firewall, or to do patient-level data lookup using fire technology to enable to see one patient at a time integrated within an EHR system. So that's being part of a full ecosystem. And the whole idea is to integrate and to create this patient-centric information common by integrating any kind of complex clinical data, for example, clinical notes, ICD code, lab value, drugs perception, and also to the knowledge coming from those clinical notes, and to integrate it with research cohort, biobank information, patient consent with an S, and then multiple omics data, gene expression, SNP, all exome sequencing, rna -seq, all genome sequencing, into the same patient level uh, and uh, centered environment. And then you have two main use cases. The first one is to use the user interface of I2B2 Transmart to be able to generate hypotheses. Will you be able, in my sense, to generate a full study just using this user interface? No. This won't work because you'll always need to, uh, um, to, uh, to, uh, to have detailed analysis in the context of the confounding factors and all that. But at least from the user interface, you can generate hypotheses, you can have feasibility study, and then to, to know if it's worth it to do a full analysis by connecting directly to the, to the database, to do high throughput analysis uh, by accessing the full data set. And so this is why we use part of this op all those open source tool and open infrastructure to create this infra uh, uh, platform. So I2B2 to store the data, Transmart as one of the user interface to access the data. We also develop a RESTful API to have a deep dive and making all the queries we can do from the user interface to be able to do it with a RESTful API. And then to, in the context of reproductible science, to use Jupyter Notebooks with Jupyter Hub to make sure that we have the full scale of the analysis that can be done by accessing directly the database. And then to have multiple variant store like SciDB, and we're also moving all our infrastructure to Docker in order for scalability and to be, uh, to be able to work across multiple cloud vendors. Today, we mostly use Amazon Web Service, where we managed to get HIPAA compliance you, and in order to make sure that we have all the protected health in, environment. What does HIPAA compliance mean in the US is to be able to and to be allowed to store protected health information. 
where you all have uh, like names of patients. Do we have HIPAA data on all our research environments? Today we have 12 projects, and all of all of them do not need to the, to have this HIPAA compliance. But what we created is an infrastructure and the way we deploy our tool so that it's we at the level of HIPAA compliance, even if we don't have HIPAA data, because it's much better to have and much easier one way to deploy all our infrastructure into a very secure environment than to have multiple versions. And then one of the key points is to make sure that we don't store any password and we know who is accessing our environment. So we separated completely the two steps. So first, the authentication of knowing who someone is from the authorization, and we created three levels of authorization. Level one is when you can access aggregate data, and level two, when you can have access to patient and data, where you can download it. So how do we do the authentication? In order to make sure that we don't store any password, we use an identity uh, manager like Odzio that enable us to have multiple enterprise identity providers like the uh, Google, uh, Facebook, or multiple enterprise from your institution hooked to the system so that we can have all the, the different app, all our applications from the user interface of I2B to Transmart or a RESTful API or using Jupyter Hub hooked to this identity provider. So to make sure we don't store any password and we know who someone is. And then now I'm going to show you uh, multiple projects where you can access today this data so that you can test our platform and see uh, the benefit of having both the I2B2 and Transmart platform. So for example, from the NIH, NCATS Global Way Disease Patient Registry, and you can access it using this URL, grdr.hms.harvard.edu, where we have integrated today more than 10 rare disease registries into one central database, one central platform that enables to do cross-query across all those different rare disease to find pathways that are potentially in common across them. And then in order to make this available, we created and integrated all those rare disease registry and using the flexibility of the I2B2 infrastructure to store all this complex phenotypic data, we also mapped all this data using the UMLS Unified Medical Language uh, from the NLM, where we have all those international ontologies to project all our data. So all the data is available is also from the raw data of how it was collected by those registries, and then we mapped it into all those 20 uh, uh, international ontologies to make sure that we, make, we can find elements that are in common across and link to all the uh, additional data sets. And this is possible due to the flexibility of the I2B2 infrastructure. The second project where you can also have access directly is the ENHANCE, the CDC National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, where this is a, a, a huge uh, data set which is publicly free, freely available where the tracks from Enhance went around the US to be able to uh, have all the patient level data with more than today 41,000 individuals where we have two, nearly 2,000 total measurements available on all the different patients uh, about with all the exposure, with the analysis from the serum, from the urine, the quantitative clinical traits. So we have qualitative variables, quantitative variables, and everything is available using the I2B2 Transmart uh, user interface. And for example, a, a simple query would be to look at all the patients with less than 25 years old versus all the patients above 25 years old. And then I want to look at the dioxin exposure of those two groups of patients and to see if there's a relation between the age and the uh, dioxin exposure. And here we can see that the result is statistically significant and automatically the user interface of I2B2 Transmart will generate uh, this hypothesis and creating a t-test with a p-value. So that's a, a very quick example and you can directly access this data set uh, because it's 100% available. But the, what the CDC made available was hundreds of Excel sheet and what we did is to have everything integrated within a nice user interface. Or you can access the same data set using our API uh, you, with this link, BD2K Picture HMS, so to have fine grain analysis of patient level data. A third project where, um, where you can have a look of how we integrated the data from the 1000 Genome Project 
where we have 56 full exomes annotated with all the phenotypic data and available through this URL, Zemo and GS. So we did a John Vine calling, variant annotation, and then integrating this data set into I2B2 Transmart to enable to do fine grained genomic queries by having all the different annotations. For example, non stop gain single allocated variant or non synonymous single allocated variant on a certain gene of interest, and then link to any kind of phenotypic variable around those patients. So to start having a genotype linked to the phenotype approach to then to be able to explore all the different phenotypes. And uh, the last project I wanted to show you is the Felin Magdamid syndrome, where this, this uh, syndrome is an extremely rare disease where there's 1,100 cases worldwide. And those patients have autistic, autistic traits for 80% of them, 100% have intellectual deficiency. And this syndrome is due to um, a deletion of the 22Q13 uh, part of the 22 chromosome. So what's in common around those patients is they all have the gene chunk free missing, missing. So if you look at the chromosome 22 here, that's one line per patient based on the genetic data. And you can see in red the size of the deletion of all the patients. So what they all have in common, all the patients, is the fact that at the end, the gene chunk free here is always missing due to a deletion or a, a point mutation within this gene. But then for some patients, there's, and most of them, you have more than one gene being deleted. And for those, for example, four patients here, they have more than 140 genes that are deleted. So there's a huge heterogeneity of the genetic material, and there's a huge heterogeneity of the phenotype because it's a syndrome where nearly all the different organs can be affected except the liver. So we have, a, this is a perfect example of the heterogeneity of the genetic material, heterogeneity of the phenotypic material. And then how can we use by combining all this data together to be able to make new biomedical discoveries? And so what we did within this project is to combine the uh, longitudinal e uh, registry data that was already existing with a new source of knowledge which is the clinical notes of those patients. By asking all the families to give us access to the fine-grained detailed clinical notes, where we did deep phenotyping by using and uh, doing natural language processing and extracting all this knowledge and then to project it into multiple different uh, uh, dictionaries. So we used the CTEX natural language processing tool to be able to extract the knowledge. But uh, for example, here, an example, wow, sorry, goes very fast, uh, by being able to extract the knowledge of um, natural language processing. For example, here, family history of obesity, but no family history of coronary heart disease. If we were only extracting the knowledge, but not with the metadata, knowing that there's a negation or knowing that there's a family history instead of the, of the patient history, this would be a non-starter because we wouldn't be able to reuse this data. So we extract the knowledge, but also this metadata of knowing if there's a negation, if there's family history, and we have more than 30 metadata around every single concept extracted. And then that's where we extract this data and we project it into all the different ontologies, SNOMED, HPO, ICD-9, ICD-10, with all the patient count, the document count, so that an investigator using the I2B2 transfer platform can then validate to be able to see the outcome that was. For example, the system automatically tells me that there's three patients out of four documents. Will I trust this? No, I need to see the raw sentence. And so by, I, by clicking on this button, I can have a pop-up window to, do, to be able to do the validation where we extracted all the sentences with a double anonymization process for an investigator to be able to validate the outcome that was uh, automatically extracted. For example, here, the Garston has been, has been seen in the global luminum, and then I can decide to accept or not, and then to do a validation in real time in the I2B3 database by enabling an investigator to update the I2B2 database directly from the user interface. So that's one of the also big interests of having the complex phenotypic data from the raw knowledge coming from those clinical nodes. And then to finish, where we are moving all our infrastructure. Today we use everything using HIPAA compliant Amazon Web Service, but then we are 
starting to use uh, Azure, IBM Cloud, and Google by signing HIPAA compliant uh, BAA so that we use Docker data centers so that we will be completely cloud agnostic across all the different cloud infrastructure. And then, uh, and that's my last slide, where the different data sets that I've showed you, you can access them to be able to play around and using this data. And this wouldn't have been possible without the great, my great team at uh, Harvard, where half, as you can see, are postdocs and the other half are uh, software developers to be able to make all this work happen. And so thank you again, uh, Diane and Rudy, for this opportunity, opportunity to present our work. Thank you, thank you very much, Paul. Um, now uh, I'd like to, let me just mute, um, E.K. Gao is going to uh, say a few words for us, just a second. I'm muted. Okay, I can say that. Yeah, can I say sandwich? Yes, you can. Uh, right. Okay. So I don't need too much slides. If you can put some, you know, your previous slides would be good. Yeah, I'm uh, getting there. Slides, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, that's fine. That's that's the right one. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good this... one. Yeah, that's that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> okay. So. You know, this integration between the ITB2 and the Transmart has been uh, discussed and also be practiced for a long time, almost entire the past three years, our history of the foundation. So um, the, 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 the sort of the philosophy is pretty clear. It's actually, you know, the slides just jump out, but that was that slides the knowledge process of transformation of medicine or position medicine. So I think everybody agree with that fully. You know, there is a two word uh, for come to this improved outcome, clinical word and uh, actually the translation word. One is more on the medical institute side, the other one probably is on the more pharmaceutical research side. The one is more emphasized on patient data. A particular phenotypical data, the other one probably more emphasized the, the phenotypical integration with actually the molecular profiling. So there is, a, uh, and one is more to do with the cohort statistics, the other one is more to do with the, uh, or the sophisticated analysis for the molecular profiling data. So there is a, quite a lot of the complementary between the two words. And, uh, you know, it's not just the poll, and uh, a lot of people in the community has already found the way and found the necessity and also found the experience to use the both uh, uh, systems for their uh, research. So what I feel is very encouraging is now we're starting to uh, get momentum on the both sides to talking about systematic integration on these two uh, systems to facilitating the research uh, informatics in the position medicine. And, uh, you know, we are responsible for uh, the transmart side of technology development, but also are leading the ETRIX uh, initiative, which is the European side of uh, uh, translation of medicine of informatics platform. And uh, we also heavily use the Transmart, but also together with the I2B2. And in the context of uh, uh, Bar Bank, and also in the context of the translational study. So I'm actually quite excited about this now, the dialogue which happening, and also the development uh, agenda we put together to drive a systematic integration of the two systems. From Transmart uh, side point of view, and we will be more look into the integration more naturally on the database, uh, on the on, on data model level, but also as Paul showed the slides, and uh, we want to uh, uh, leverage the common API and leverage the bidirectional communication between the two systems. Uh, moreover, right, there's a more system be built 
in each side, like uh, data harmonization engine to enforce the clinical data standard, and also the system we built on the Jupyter-based sort of the parallel versions of the analytical algorithm, which we call the, uh, the Etrix analytical engine, EAE. So this will enhance further the underlying computational facility and the data infrastructure for both the Transmart and the I2B2. So what we really want to do is uh, we try to build a sustainable but also uh, robust systems uh, for this community, for the position medicine research community, to have an open source software people can really rely on for their research. So this is the mission we want to carry it out. So we have a lot of enthusiastic developers in the Transmart community. And uh, I also know we are now closely talking to the I2B2 uh, 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 community. So this dialogue will be only helpful and by uh, people can keep in, to give us the feedback of the usage and to give us actually the uh, guidance from the user point of view and how those systems can be further evolved. And uh, that is really, you know, from the development side, and we are understand very well about the need. We quite committed to make this happen. So that's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. That's great. So um, what we'd like to do now is uh, summarize kind of kind of our uh, the, the discussions here, and uh, I've asked Keith Elston to to give us uh, a brief. Kind of summary, and um, Keith, turn it over to you. Uh, thanks, Rudy, and uh, thanks, Paul, and, and EK, uh, and Diane. Uh, I have to say that that you know we're all very excited about uh, you know having I two B two and Transmart work more closely together. Uh, when we look at the ecosystem uh, that that we're playing in, uh, it's really one where uh, when we think of I two B two as going from integrating informatics from biology to the bedside. Uh, we can almost take that and advance it to uh, integrating uh, uh, informatics uh, and going from the bench to the bedside. And that's really the mission of, of precision medicine. Uh, and I think we're uniquely positioned using the I2B2 data model, uh, the Transmart platform, the I2B2 platform, as well as the working with Shrine and Smart uh, to be able to work seamlessly between uh, patient care facilities, uh, payers, providers, uh, etc., uh, all the way back to the to the translational research scientists working at the bench to identify biomarkers, identify key markers of, of efficacy and and influence treatment. And one of the things that leads to, as we think about it, is is into what people now call the learning healthcare system, where we can take and, and routinely move information back and forth between these environments and improve uh, the treatment that we're able to provide to patients. And I think that's all, uh, that's what all of us here are interested in doing. And I think working more closely here is going to provide that, uh, that capability. Uh, next slide, Rudy. Um, and we were gonna talk a little bit about the, the Transmart Roadmap. I don't know if that's important here. What I would say is, is I think that's what's important and interesting to everyone here. Um, is as we bring I2B2 and Transmart closer together, we work towards integration, as Paul has demonstrated. Uh, one of the keys is that, uh, that both Transmart and I2B2 will continue to work um, as they have and to go through their processes. One of the really unique aspects of the Transmart uh, Foundation Roadmap has been uh, the community-based development that we've had, which really spawns a lot of innovation. Uh, one of the challenges with that is, is having people code to the same standards to have a well-developed release process where people are committing code, testing code, etc. And as we've gone through the last couple of uh, release cycles, 16.1 and now 16.2, uh, which has just been released, um, and moving forward into 17.1, which is just finishing its development phase, uh, is that um, you know we have a, a, an evolving code base. We have a lot of community involvement and, and capability, uh, and continuing uh, along that path to ensure that we have the the most 
innovative and, and integrative tools that we can is, is an important aspect. Next slide. Um, as we as we think about uh, how we go together, what's important for us to think about is is the vision, and the vision between the, the Transmart uh, community and the I2B2 community, I think, is is very similar and and very overlapping, and that is we we want the platforms to be easy to bring up uh, and to run in a basic mode. We know these are enterprise products, but the fact is is if you can more easily install it and test it, you're more likely to adopt it and use it. Uh, today, uh, when you go to install Transmart, there's a simple script that will run. Uh, it does take you know an hour to an hour and a half, depending on network connectivity. Uh, but there's an automated install that will bring it up and, and get it running in a basic mode for you. And there's a, a simple script uh, with a config file that will get you uh, uh, data loaded, uh, and you can choose from the 130 different uh, Transmart ready data sets that are available. Uh, the goal is also to have you know a very high quality as we would call it, commercial grade core with extensibility. A key aspect of current uh, and uh, Transmart developments are to develop a, a stronger set of APIs. And as you talk to Paul about uh, aspects of integrating ITV2 and Transmart, having a well-developed set of APIs uh, is really critical. Uh, it's also important to, to manage the code base. Both I2B2 and Transmart have today what I would call well-managed code bases. Uh, ITB2 coming from a centralized uh, code management has had a long history of a very high quality, well managed code base. And at the Transmart Foundation, we've gone from a, you know sort of a, a, a less well organized community uh, contribution base to where we've integrated uh, large numbers of codes uh, into a single code base. And then as we continue to advance that to implement quality initiatives uh, and key quality standards, testing, etc., so that that code base. Uh, continues to grow in a very high quality way. Uh, we also have a well-managed developer community and well-organized developer community. With Transmart we have uh, over 100 developers that contribute to the code base on each release cycle uh, and that's a very active community and, and, and a, a well-growing community. And the other key element is being able to readily share data and make data available. Uh, when we look at the federation capabilities of I2B2, we look at the uh, ability to share data between instances with Transmart, uh, the fact is, is, is we really want to continue to grow the means of, of sharing and collaborating using uh, translational and clinical data. Next slide. Uh, what that brings us to is, is really thinking about um, ITB2 and Transmart being part of a, a single ecosystem, and certainly not not uh, not alone standalone elements of that ecosystem. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, but really tying into many other capabilities. Uh, as we've gone along, Transmart um, has a lot of connectivity to R, SAS, uh, Python, Jupyter, uh, et cetera. And it, uh, it's that connectivity that allows people to, as Paul says, uh, form a hypothesis uh, early in the process directly using uh, the analytics built in, and then to export those data to more complex uh, environments to do further types of analytics. And I think it's really important to have that hypothesis generation, hypothesis testing uh, capability right out of the box. Uh, but with I2B2, there's uh, great connectivity with EHR systems, being able to take clinical data uh, from an active, ongoing clinical uh, environment and bring that into a structured environment for analysis as, it, as it's done in I2B2. Uh, there's also some nice capabilities with, uh, with Smart and Shrine, uh, being able to do queries across uh, across platforms, across implementations, to identify patients with particular sets of phenotypes, uh, and also to have uh, key plugins and apps uh, that work with the APIs, uh, and we see this growing with the Transmart applications as well. <coughs> Another growing area uh, for uh, the platforms are uh, the use of not just uh, genetic variants and full genome data, but uh, the use of biobanks um, and being able to query directly those biobanks. And as we grow into things like exposomic data and other uh, key data types that are important in the clinical environment. I think this the single ecosystem is something that you know, will help us think more clearly about how I2B2 and Transmart work together to bring data both to the translational community and to the clinical community. Next slide, Rudy. And that brings us to to one of the, the key views that, that really catalyzes our thinking, and that is this, uh, the data to knowledge process. 
and how uh, we have a unique opportunity with ITB2 and Transmart. And then we have a well-established translational research system that's in use broadly across uh, pharma, biotech, uh, biotech, and academic translational research facilities. Uh, and we have uh, ITB2, a clinical research platform that has been broadly uh, uh, implemented across academic medical centers, uh, various uh, hospital systems, and more. Uh, and by bringing them together, ensuring that we have compatibility between these two platforms, we will link directly from the patient record back to the bench scientist doing biomarker discovery, and it creates an environment for, for many different kinds of new opportunities. So uh, working more collaboratively here together and working more closely as we go forward in the future is really going to enable new opportunities for uh, establishing clinical research collaborations, uh, sharing data, and, and moving the whole process of precision medicine uh, forward. Next slide. I think that's the last slide. Good. I was hoping it was. I was like, what did I put on the next one? Um, so what I wanted to do is, is I want to thank, you know, I want to thank Rudy and Diane uh, for organizing this and leading this off. I want to thank you know, Paula Viak uh, and, and E.K. Go uh, for giving us, you know, some, some key aspects of the technical vision. And, uh, you know, to put out there to the community that uh, what we're looking at doing is being much more collaborative uh, in the development of ITB2 and Transmart. Uh, ensuring some compatibility between the platforms and, and capabilities, and, and having a single ecosystem as we go forward. And I think that will, will be uh, hugely beneficial to the overall community. Um, Rudy and Diane will also be working in, in ways to establish some more collaboration between our user communities and, and finding new opportunities there as we did last year uh, with the Precision Medicine Conference and the ITB2 user meeting and the Transmart uh, community meeting. Uh, we hope again to do that this year. I think it's a great opportunity to bring the communities together, and we look forward to, to a lot more uh, interactive collaborations across the community. So with that, Rudy, I think you wanted to open it up to, to questions from the audience. Yeah, that's right. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Actually, two questions were about the same thing. Uh, will the presentations be available? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, again, hopefully by the end of the day, uh, we will have them out there on the website uh, for you, and so you'll be able to take a look at them as well as the recording. Um, we also have a question about, uh, this I guess is for Paul, what's the granularity of the authorization to be given, uh, given the variety of data that's available on the platform? Uh, could you comment on that, Paul? Let's see if you're... Uh, it, it really depends on uh, the, what's great is you're using those tools. There's many different ways to address this problem and to uh, because at the, and the, the, the key point, and that's why I was showing the, um, the first the authentication part and a, an example of how we handle the authorization with the different le level of access control, to make sure that we can have, uh, based on the project you have, to make sure that you are compliant with what you want to do. So up to now, based on all the different research projects, we were able to have uh, the fine grain detailed uh, access control by sub uh, uh, folders within the I2B2 Transmart infrastructure with dif different users. And so we were able to do it with the um, using the concept path in order to do this. And the but at the end it really depends on what your project is and uh, uh, what you have to do. So there's a great flexibility and there's different methods of doing it. And the, um, uh, so the, it really, so that's the, the great part of it. Okay, thank you. Um, just uh, just as a, a quick note, there are three ways you can ask a question. You can raise your hand and ask it and I will unmute you. You can type one into the chat window, or you can type a question into the question panel. So I have another question. Uh, let's see. There's a plan. There's a plan to build a unique web interface that integrates both capabilities. Uh, is, is there a plan? Um, yes. I, and yes, and we're working on it. Yes. Yeah, if I could just add a, a little note to that one, Rudy. You know, one of the things I've, I've asked E.K. And, and Paul to do is to work more closely together in finding you know, ways to enhance the compatibility between ITB2 and Transmart. 
Um, we had the, the first of those meetings uh, last week, uh, and I'll continue to, to do that as we go forward and make sure that that thinking is incorporated into all of our software development. Okay. Um, Jay is asking a question. Is the BAA this signable for a Google App instance as well as a G Suite? Uh, you were using this for a Transmart instance, I guess, for, for you, Paul? Uh, hi, Jay. Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand your question. I'm not sure I do either. Can you unmute? Can you unmute, uh, Jay? I will. Okay, Jay, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hey, Paul. So I saw on your slide that you're using uh, a business associate ag agreement right. uh, f with Google, and I'm one. And I know that that's signable for the G Suite set of applications that are sort of uh, standard things like Gmail. Is that also applicable to, uh, for example, in uh, an application instance such as a Transmart instance running on the Google Cloud? Because uh, if so, that would be really That'd be really interesting because um, it could cover the HIPAA um, HIPAA compliance issues uh, on the Google Cloud. Thanks. Yes. So the um, so thanks for this question. the The BAA, the Business Associated Agreement, is a um, uh, for example the one with uh, Amazon. It's a six page uh, document explaining be, being signed between an institution for example, Harvard University and Amazon. And the, um, there's also, we, uh, 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 there's also, I saw the, also the BAA between Boston Children's Hospital and Amazon. Both BAA are different because there's a negotiation between lawyers, between the different institutions around the uh, level of expertise, around the liability, about, around what has needs to be logged. And so, once the, 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 the BAA that was signed were on using the Amazon infrastructure of to deploy our application. And so there's a list of servers on Amazon Web Service that is authorized. When we signed, there were seven. Today, there's 10 servers. And what's great is in the meantime, that for example, they, they added Amazon RDS. So the list of what is authorized is based on what's written in the BAA. The approach we're having so with the cloud provider is not, for example, to go down the road of the G Suite uh, from Google, is to use Google as Google Cloud and not the application. So maybe, but there's, uh, so at the end, what I'm saying is it really depends on what you are uh, uh, the burden you are interested of taking of getting the BAA signed because it takes an incredible amount of time to do this uh, around one year of negotiation, um, and so I, I so what we did is to uh, right now we have one signed with Amazon and Azure that's done with Google and uh, IBM Cloud it's uh, uh, on the way it's not signed yet so there's a lot of back and forth. But we didn't integrate the G Suite because we are, we are uh, what I wanted is to be able to have, uh, to deploy our infrastructure, our uh, server, our application of I2B2 Transmart on their cloud and not to use uh, their tool. So, um, uh, so at the end, it really depends on what is in the BAA and, uh, and maybe uh, the J and everyone that is interested in this you should be involved since the beginning in what your institution will be interested in signing with um, those cloud providers because then you can have a huge input if at the end you want to have to add additional service that are not are not listed okay, great thank, thank you very much paul I, I, uh, thank you okay we have another question from douglas bell uh, on security AWS security, uh, beyond the BAA, there's a raft of requirements on you to implement, like intrusion detection and audit logs. Uh, can you share how you're addressing these? Yes. I will, yeah. And uh, definitely, and I would have, uh, so what the way we did it is, and definitely, and that's part 
part of the BAA. In the BAA, um, there's, um, there's a lot of technical uh, detail uh, on what needs to be done, and that's exactly how you describe of the auditing, where at the end everything needs to be audited from the user perspective, from the infrastructure perspective. And so you using uh, and it's on our responsibility at uh, Harvard and uh, me as investigator, when I put PHI data on the cloud, where I have to fulfill all those requirements to make sure that we are protected. So we there's not one uh, the best solution. It really depends on what different tools you want to use. So for example, for log auditing, uh, looking at what is the, the Cadillac, the Rolls Royce, the best tool that exists for log auditing is Splunk. So that's why we use Splunk in order to do the audit log of everything. From, and that's how we have very, very detailed report of everything that is going on. And so we have a, a great collaboration with Splunk um, uh, doing this. And also many other tools to, uh, because Splunk is at the log level, but we also needed to monitor what is going on at um, on the Amazon cloud level. So we use Cloud Checker, we use uh, Datadog. And uh, so we've tested many of the different tools for the uh, to make sure that we were fulfilling all the different requirements which is at the end a, a, a huge checklist of everything that needs to be done. So there's not one best solution, uh, but there's different tools that can help you to do this. And there's, yes, there's redundancy across all the different tools, but at the end it's definitely possible to do it. Uh, thank you, thank you, Paul. Douglas, does that answer your question? I unmuted you. Yeah, that's um, that's great. I mean. Um, uh, maybe it's worth an offline discussion sure. uh, yep. for more details. Okay, great. Okay, anyone else have any questions? I don't see anything else, any other hands raised. Um, okay. Um, well, I think with that, we will close. Thanks, uh, everyone, for your participation and uh, staying with us. Thanks to uh, Diane, to Paul, to EK, and Keith. And uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, this recordings, as I said, and the presentations will be available uh, in a few hours. So thanks, everyone. Thank you.